Good morning, everybody. Wisconsin 7th Congressional District Representative Tom Tiffany is our very special guest today, Thursday, December 14th, 2023. For Dryden.com, I'm Ben Dryden, and you're watching Dryden Wire Live, presented by Americans for Prosperity Wisconsin. AFP Wisconsin works to reignite the American dream and break down government barriers that hold us back from our full potential. Learn more at americansforprosperity.org and join AFP to fight for more freedom for all Wisconsinites. A special thank you to some of our recent guests on Dryden Wire Live, including Wisconsin State Senator Romaine Quinn, Sawyer County Judge John Yackel, Barron County Sheriff Chris Fitzgerald, who of course joins me every Tuesday for our weekly Positive Tuesday with Ben and Fitzy show, and former Wisconsin Attorney General Judge Brad Schimmel, who had just announced his candidacy for Wisconsin Supreme Court. We were the first ones to have him on uh, for a show, Tom. It was so great. Uh, you can watch a recording of those shows and all of our previous chats on our website at drydenware.com, right here on Facebook under our videos tab, or just go to YouTube, go to our Drydenware YouTube channel, which is just youtube.com slash Drydenwire. But today we are being joined by Wisconsin's 7th Congressional District Representative Tom Tiffany, who joins us every month, the second, two, or second Thursday of every month. Uh, Tom Tiffany. Tom, good morning, sir. And before I forget, hey, happy early birthday. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. By the way, it's no surprise to those of us that know Dryden Wire that Brad Schimmel would choose to Aww. come to your place first. I mean, the blowtorch in Spooner, um, where else would you go first in Wisconsin? All right, that's enough. That's enough. <laughs> Thank you. That was very nice. Uh, it was an honor. I, I've known Brad for years. Uh, he's such a great guy. And I, I, as you know me, I don't really care about the politics part of it or where people stands or views or et cetera. I probably should, but I don't. Uh, he's just a stand up dude, man. The dude's legit. I was so happy to have him on. Yeah. Did he play bass on the show? No, no. One I mean, of these days his, I want him to. Yeah, that's his claim to fame. So yeah, you have to is. get him on with his band. That would be great. That would yeah. be wonderful. Uh, so we have uh, a few things I wrote down here. Uh, I, I think I saw somewhere that you had a deer listening session, which I'm pretty sure that doesn't mean you were listening to deer, but it was in our area here in the uh, northwest Wisconsin. I think it was in Solon Springs. Uh, but I want to start right away with you had a press release out yesterday, and, and it's uh, your press release was Representative Tiffany's statement on formalizing impeachment inquiry. And you had stated in your press release, the American people deserve transparency, and this process will give the House additional investigative abilities to uncover the facts about the president's involvement in his family foreign business deals. So where are we on this, and what is your role in this? Okay. Would you like to start with um, the impeachment inquiry? I would, actually, because that one seems very topical. Uh, we had some headlines this morning, including House votes to formalize Biden impeachment inquiry, escalating GOP probe. It seems the most topical thing, so I'd kind of like to start there, if that's all right. Just so you know, many of your constituents would rather talk about deer than uh, the Biden family. That's or a true story. In yes. Washington, D.C. Yes. But, uh, yes, we passed uh, an impeachment inquiry bill yesterday that makes it official that we are going to do an impeachment inquiry in the House of Representatives. And what precipitated this is, so you've had almost a years long um, uh, investigation that has been done by the Subcommittee on Oversight and Judiciary chaired by Representative James Comer from Kentucky. And you've seen all this information that has come out in regards to the Biden family. Um, but there are a few members uh, that are affiliated with the Biden family, like we're business partners with Hunter Biden, and uh, they're refusing to testify. What the in official inquiry does is it um, affords us a greater authority to go to the courts and say someone that does not want to comply with one of our subpoenas, that they have to do that that they have to come in and do the deposition and share the information that they know in regards to the Biden family and all this um, stuff that uh, their um, agreements that they struck the uh, with people in foreign countries, the, the businesses that are um, in foreign countries, Burisma in Ukraine, the Chinese oil company, just various entities like that. It requires them to come forward and give us that information. So it's just the next step in the process. This is not impeachment. 
It's just an impeachment inquiry to get us more information. Gives us greater authority to be able to use uh, subpoenas to gather information. But so you're saying that this now, if there was a subpoena that was sent out to have them go uh, or to appear, were people not appearing? And now this means that they have to. I mean, a subpoena it sounds like that's something you have to show up for. Well, for the average person, uh, you do have to show up for a subpoena. <laughs> right. But like, yeah, but like yesterday morning, uh, Hunter Biden, the president's son. Uh, went before the cameras and he said, I'm not going to show up for a deposition before the Judiciary Committee. So we um, a deposition is oftentimes something that happens in the lead up to just gathering information in regards to a court case. And um, Hunter Biden said, I'm not going to appear for this deposition. And Hopefully what will happen now with us having an official impeachment inquiry, we're going to be able to go to him and say, you need to provide this information. And I'll give you an example that's somewhat parallel to this. So it was a number of months ago, FBI Director uh, Ray, we asked him for information along these lines, uh, as well as other information of uh, things that the FBI is doing. FBI Director Ray refused to give us that information. And so... Uh, we went back to him and said, you know, you really need to provide this information to the American people. And we don't want to go to a subpoena, but if you're going to force us to do it. And ultimately, he relented and shared that information to us. So that's kind of what happens is you have this back and forth that goes on in this process. And hopefully now um, uh, when we uh, when some of Hunter Biden and his business associates say, no, we don't want to do this, that our subpoenas will have the force of law in courts and the judges will say, yeah, you do need to provide this information to the American people. Because that's ultimately what it's all about. So what is driving this? Is, is it the, the Hunter Biden, that storyline and the information there, and they're trying to find, or if there is, not trying to, like purposely trying to find, but we need to look into this to see if there is a connection between the son and the dad. Is it the yes. is it the Hunter Biden's uh, aspect that's driving this? So he's in the middle of it, but really he's just a supporting actor in this. This is really about Joe Biden. You know that someone has a crackhead son that went wayward and whatever. I mean that story's happened many times across America. That's not the 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 main story here. It is is the president then Vice President Joe Biden? Did he use his office to enrich his family? And so you have all this information that has come out. So you had like uh, President uh, Biden said, I never um, consulted with my son about his business dealings. Well, it turns out that there were 20 phone calls that he made to his son that they did talk about his business dealings. And by the way, that was corroborated by Devin Archer, one of Hunter Biden's business associates. He gave us that information back in August. They formed 20 shell companies. In other words, 20 fake companies. There was over $20 million that went through those companies. So you have all that information that continues to grow. And now in the last month or so, Representative Comer has shown that there were checks written directly to Hunter Biden, $40,000, $200,000 that went directly to Joe Biden's bank account. So you just end up having more questions as we provide more information about what really went on here. How did you get all of this money? And so the next step now is the impeachment inquiry. And um, I think the American public deserves answers in regards to this. Is this just a, a lot of people have to assume, and by a lot of people, maybe on the other side of the aisle, a witch hunt? What do you say when people think, or when people uh, share those views and opinions that, what are we doing? They're, they're, this is much ado about nothing. This is just a political tactic to go after someone but come on, there's nothing here. Sure, sure. And, and, and that's what many people uh, on the other side are saying. Sure. But as more information co becomes available, I mean, there has to be real concern even on the other side. I mean, checks directly to Joe Biden of $40,000, $200,000, they claim them to be loans. Why didn't they claim the interest then on their tax returns? I mean, why didn't Hunter Biden register as a foreign agent? You're supposed to do that. He represented Burisma, the oil company in Ukraine. The family received, I think there was 
uh, one of the Ukrainians said that we gave five million dollars to the son. We gave five million dollars to the father. And so you have all this information out there and we are connecting the dots. By the way, there's additional information that is out there. Um, so banks, um, they will put out, uh, they're required to put out notices of questionable foreign transactions. There were over 170 um, uh, bank transactions that were highlighted by banks saying, this is a questionable transaction that went on with these Biden family transactions. So you have all of this information. And that's what we're trying to share with the American public at this point, is that we have all this information. You should see it also because I believe Joe Biden is innocent until he's proven guilty. I will not be like Adam Schiff, especially with the second uh, Trump impeachment, where it was ready, fire, aim, where he just said, we're just going to, we are going to declare that we're going to impeach um, Donald Trump and we will show you the evidence later. And that's not the way to go about this. Joe Biden is innocent until he is proven guilty. And by the way, one other quick point, Ben, to me, this is not, so while Hunter Biden is a central character in all of this, this is not, in my mind, it's not about Hunter Biden. It is about uh, Vice President Joe Biden, President Joe Biden. Did he use his influence via his son to enrich their family? And when you see these hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes millions of dollars that has flowed to family members, I think the American public deserve answers. And, and so what is, now that this has happened, uh, I believe you're going to be coming up soon here, I think, uh, kind of finishing for the calendar year anyway. So what's next in this now that you're looking into this and you want to subpoena show up to so we can ask you some questions? What's next on the agenda? Is this uh, we don't really know yet or, well, we have something scheduled in January or February? What I would guess Representative Comer, the chairman of this oversight committee, will do is he will um, ask. He will say, um, we want to do a deposition with you. Um, there's a couple other people. Eric Schwerwin, he was a. Um, Hunter Biden associate, uh, and there's others besides him, they're going to ask them to be deposed. In other words, share information about their business dealings with the Biden family. And so that'll be the next thing. They'll ask for those depositions. If they refuse to do it, much like Hunter Biden, then I would guess you will see subpoenas. Uh, and if they refuse to honor the subpoenas, then I would guess Representative Comer would take that subpoena to a judge and say, this person needs to provide information to us because it may be central to what we see as the scheme that went on. And hopefully the judge will say, yeah, the deposition should be honored. You need to testify. I think those will be the next steps. And I would guess that they're probably have, um, they're in the works as we speak. Uh, you're on the House Judiciary Committee, correct? I am. And that's uh, for people who don't know, explain just in a nutshell, if you could, what is that committee typically tasked with? So as far as issues that are, uh, I, I mean, we deal with the intelligence agencies, we deal with the courts. I mean, it is the Judiciary Committee uh, dealing with the law in the United States of America and those who carry out the laws of the United States of America at the federal level. Sure. So border is part of it. Uh, censorship, as we see, what, like with the big tech companies, we deal with that. Um, so there's a variety of things uh, is, like that that we deal with. Is there anything that has uh, come before the committee recently that you're like, wow, this is kind of a big deal. People should pay attention to this. Yeah, FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Oh, OK, F uh, so I'm not I'm familiar with that very much. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, uh, so could you explain that? Yeah, most people are, are not real familiar with it. But, um, you know, in simple terms, it was created after 9-11. So we had these, you know, the horrific events of 9-11. Yeah. And they're like, um, our intelligence agencies are like, we got to get intel on these foreign actors before mm -hmm. they come in and blow up Americans. Love it. And uh, so the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act was created out of that. And um, uh, that is, bef it gets renewed every five years. This is five years right now at the end of December. And so there is an active debate that's going on within um, Congress of should there be reforms to FISA? 
And uh, we in judiciary propose significant reforms to FISA because it has been used against Americans. Um, it start, it's the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, right? Mm -hmm. It should be used against foreigners, not against Americans. And so right. what we've seen is warrantless searches of Americans via FISA. There were 3 million examples. I think it was 3 million was the count uh, in 2021. Now, the FBI said they have reformed that. That was wrong that they were doing it. And they said it's down to about 200,000 in 2022. That's still about 500 a day. And I think that's too many times that this act, FISA, is being used against Americans. It's supposed to be used on foreigners. All right, hold on. You said warrantless. So no warrant. Is that, is that what you're that saying? Is, they can uh, give an example of what this would look like for an American citizen. Use me. So, so uh, warrantless, like the FBI just comes in and does whatever. Explain this a little bit more if you could, like in a, in a real life situation. So they might go to like a uh, one of the cell companies, uh, one mm -hmm. of the cellular services. Mm -hmm. They may go to one of the tech companies that mm -hmm. handle email and they say to them, we want this information on this person and their email is this. Those companies have to comply with that. And uh, but what um, uh, the FBI and other in the Department of Justice at times has done is they've used FISA rather than getting a warrant for an American. If you are an American, they should have to get a warrant. You should not be able to do this with surveil someone without a warrant. You shouldn't be able to get their information via a cell phone, you know, a text, whatever, be able to intercept the, that information without a warrant if you're doing it to an American. And they've been abusing that. So you had said three million in what year was that? Twenty twenty one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Twenty twenty one. And, and, and I'm sorry. Go ahead. And they reduced it. Uh, uh, FBI Director Ray was before us in this summer, and he says, "Hey, that was wrong. We reduced it down to about two hundred thousand. Now we're like, well, that's five hundred a day. That's that's still you incredible know? number. That's, I mean, good job getting farther. it down to two hundred thousand, but that's a lot. Um, when you say that, like, yeah, that was wrong. Uh, what was the reasoning for that? I mean, three million. Good Lord, Jesus loves me. That's that's a lot. Was it, uh, yeah, sorry about that. We were wrong. But to explain, like, why those were done? Why three million in a year? Uh, they've really never given a good explanation. Mm. So so uh, I think it's important to say the reforms that we want to do is that we want to limit the number of um, um, Department of Justice, in particular FBI um, uh, personnel that can use this. Because when we asked about it, the FBI said, well, any FBI agent can do it. So there's like 10,000 people. So we're like, hold it. You got to limit this to just a few people that use this very specific way of surveilling, um, um, surveilling people that are supposed to be overseas. So that's part of the reforms in the bill is to restrict the number of people. But we've also put tougher penalties in place for anyone that abuses it. So if you have an FBI agent that abuses it, We've made those penalties tougher in the reform that we've proposed in the Judiciary Committee. And where are your your caucus? Where are the Republicans, your peers? Oh, where really are they split. on this? Yeah, we're really split. Those really? of us in the those of us in the Judiciary Committee, we're like these reforms are needed. And um, the people on the Intelligence Committee, they're like, hold it a second, don't take away our tools to be able to get at these bad foreign actors because yeah. we see. We see all these examples, and they do see them. Um, they're oftentimes in, um, uh, uh, I hate to use the word secret, but they're confidential uh, meetings that they cannot share the information. Okay. Um, we have them occasionally. Well, the intel people see these examples of how FICE is being used that, I mean, it prevents a bad thing from happening. Uh, so yeah. they come from a different perspective. They're like, we got to make sure we secure the American people. And we're like, hold it. We got in judiciary, we got to protect people's constitutional rights. So you have kind of a difference of opinion that happens there. But I believe the Judiciary Committee bill um, should be advanced because at the end of the day, I think we satisfy the Intel Committee's concerns by allowing exceptions. If they think something is so important in the intelligence agencies that they have to deal with it right now, 
we do allow them a loophole that I'm kind of concerned about, but we do allow them a loophole to be able to act immediately if they think if they think there's an immediate concern to interdict someone. And as far as the other side of the aisle, as it were, the Democrats, where do you believe they are in this? Is it also kind of split? Is this a not a really Republican or Democrat thing at this point? This uh, there's other factors that are kind of uh, more important for your your constitu- or your colleagues. That is correct. Um, in the Judiciary Committee, we passed our FISA reform bill 35 to 2. Almost every Democrat joined us Republicans in voting for it. And a big part of the reason that they voted for it, we included a bill that they really wanted to pass, which is the um, um, getting in- intelligence information via a backdoor, buying information. So what you have is data brokers out there. I mean, we all know our information that's out there. It gets harvested, right? Um, in so many different ways by the telecommunications companies. Well, what the FBI was doing is they would buy information from data brokers about Americans in uh, to be able to surveil them. In other words, they used a back door to be able to get information on Americans that gets shut off. You cannot buy on under our bill. You cannot buy information from data brokers and use that to surveil Americans. Understood. So, so it's it's. It, it's a really interesting dynamic. This is not your classic Republican versus Democrat issue. Uh, hey, speaking of, <clears throat> uh, George Santos, I believe, is no longer uh, <laughs> one of your colleagues there. Uh, I believe that you had actually voted no. I think I saw a story about that. They made it a big story that uh, you voted no to expel him. Uh, maybe you have already stated this somewhere. I haven't seen it. But what was your reasoning for not voting to expel him? Yeah, we put a press release out in regards to this, okay. why I voted no. Um, he has not been convicted. And I believe until someone is convicted, uh, we should not be running them out of Congress. I mean, the people of his district in New York voted for him. They had a chance to vet him. The Democrats had a chance to vet him. Obviously, they didn't vet him very well. And he serves for two years and their voters can decide, are you going to send him back to Congress or not? I mean, just... Uh, I do not agree with many of the things that he's done or does, but that's not for me to judge. And until he's convicted, we should not be running him out. And I'd give you a parallel to this. The Democrats got their representative, Jamal Bowman, also from New York. He's the one that pulled the fire alarm and stopped us from being able to vote. And he was declared guilty. Why is he not held to the same standard that he should be removed from Congress. Now, some people will say, well, pulling a fire alarm is not as bad as what George Santos did. I don't know about that. Pulling a fire alarm to stop us. He deliberately did that to stop us from voting because we were having key votes that day in regards to, I think it was the continuing resolution um, and the border bill that we had included in there. And uh, so he deliberately did that. So I think it's a double standard that has been used there. And so that's why I voted against um, um, removing George Santos. From uh, do, was there any thought process on your end in making that decision where precedent came into your uh, your thinking? Because obviously precedent is, well, it is what it is. We use this in our court system all the time. And, and to, to set a precedent, because I believe this hasn't happened before for someone who hasn't been convicted of a felony in a court of law. I don't believe it's happened before. Maybe if it has, it's been a very long time where now we're kind of setting that, okay, it's done before. So this is, it could get a little wonky here going forward. Was precedent a part of your decision-making? Yeah. I mean, we should be cautious about using it's a, that is an incredible authority that's been used very rarely to remove someone from Congress. I think we should be very careful about doing those things, especially no one has been removed since the Civil War from the United States Congress that was not declared guilty of of a crime. And so I think it's a dangerous precedent for us to set. There's no doubt about it. I mean, it's just like it's a dangerous precedent for some of these very powerful Uh, tools that we have, like impeachment. That's why I don't rush into this impeachment thing in regards to President Biden. Um, um, That's why I think it's really important for us to, we've been steady and methodical, and now we're doing the inquiry rather, I mean, I have friends messaging me all the time. Why aren't you impeaching him already? 
I don't think it's appropriate to do this in a rapid fire fashion. You have to show the American people a justification for doing these type of things. And I think we're in too much of a rush to use a variety of these tools that we have, including Nancy Pelosi throwing people off from committees last session. Yeah. I think you got to be very careful about doing things like that when you have people yeah. who are legitimately elected by their constituents. Yeah, and it sounds like the impeachment process is just that, an impro- a process, and it sounds like you're still in the fact-gathering aspect of it. That is correct. Okay. Uh, so I want to quickly ask you, because we're almost up against our time already, and of course we got to talk about you know deer hunting, <laughs> apparently. Yeah. Um, but uh, this morning, I just want your thoughts on this. I have two headlines. This is our U.S. and World headline links this morning. Uh, one was Biden criticism of Israel hints at deeper tensions. Another is Kamala Harris pushes White House to be more sympathetic towards Palestinians. What are you seeing over there? What are your thoughts about this? It seems to be we support Israel, but maybe not support Israel, but we do. But, you know, careful. Is it turning into a political thing? How is this going over in Washington, D.C.? Oh, I think uh, uh, Republicans and many Democrats, I don't know if I can say most Democrats, but many Democrats support Israel and their right to existence and uh, that they should be able to deal with what just happened when 1,400 of their citizens were slaughtered. Um, So, uh, you know, we generally support that in the Congress, but you've got a healthy number of people now that are uh, are not supportive of Israel. And let's go back to, I mean, remember, many of the people that populate the Biden administration at this point, they are holdovers from the Obama administration. President Obama despised Israel. And he only said good things when he had to. He does not like Israel. And many of the people that were followers of President Obama think the same way. There is no doubt about it that they do not believe that Israel should be able to defend itself um, to the point where they say, "We, we must eliminate Hamas on our border or they're going to come in and kill our citizens once again. And I think at this point, Israel is just ignoring them. And they are going in and doing what they need to do to Hamas. Mm. Uh, we have a statement here. Holy cow, that's really large. I'm sorry. I need to. F- I'm not sure why that's. Oh, my goodness. It's all being jacked up. I apologize for that. There we go. Anyway, it says your vote to impeach President Biden with no evidence is an abuse. Four years of investigation and zero proof. That is disturbing. So, not quite a uh, uh, comment, but it sounds like a fan. One- no, I. Yeah, and I'd be happy to comment on sure. that to, to Brian. Please. So first of all, the investigation has not been going on for four years. It just started this year, um, early in 2023, and it's been steady and methodical. And um, I certainly have not prejudged President Biden in regards to that. So, and also, this is not impeachment. This is an impeachment inquiry. And I can assure people out there, I don't care where you stand politically, I view President Biden as innocent until we can prove, um, um, you know, until we can prove without yeah. any doubt that uh, uh, he took money from these foreign countries using his office to enrich himself. And um, I'm going to take, I'm going to go where the evidence takes us. You were in Solon Springs, I believe, recently for a deer listening session, which is still yeah. sounds funny to me because you're not listening to deer. Uh, tell us about that. Well, first of all, it was not, I did not put it together. Uh, the state representatives put it together, and I really give them a lot of credit. Uh, Representative Angie Sapic, uh, Senator Quinn, uh, Representative Chance Green, uh, and there was a couple, uh, Representative Dave Armstrong was there, Representative Jimmy Boy Edming. They were there to listen to hunters and sportsmen, and a good turnout. I think there was a at least 100 people in the room up there in Solon Springs. And uh, there was really some good testimony. I mean, you had some of the normal stuff where people, you know, DNR bashing and stuff like that. But there were some people that came forward with some really good ideas and really some good perspectives about why the deer hunt is gone, uh, why it has become abysmal really here in northern Wisconsin. And I hear about it all the time also. And uh, there's some real problems out there, but it starts with predators. To me, it just starts with predators. And uh, while it's primarily wolves, I mean, our state is so full of predators. Bobcat numbers continue to grow, bear numbers. I mean, we have so many predators. I mean, 
there's just a story in the outdoor news in regards to a cougar that got um, arrowed down in Buffalo County because he was tracking a hunter down in Buffalo County this fall. I mean, we have predators out the yin yang here in Wisconsin, and it's having an effect on the deer season, especially in northern Wisconsin. And something needs to be done about it. First of all, I mean, we should have a wolf hunt. And it's unfortunate that we don't. And that's why I continue to introduce bills to be able to deal with that. But I think there's also some mismanagement that goes on there. And I think that hunters are really getting frustrated at this point. And um, uh, you're seeing many of them no longer buy tags um, to hunt, especially in northern Wisconsin. It also has a great economic impact. As one person who was there, um, he owns a bar restaurant. Um, I think it was up in the Iron River area. And he was talking about, you, you know, bars oftentimes had a buckboard, right? Yeah. And you'd be able to buy a chance, you know. Um, I think about some of my neighbors over south of Manaqua, they'd have as many as 150, reg, uh, 150 people that put their name on a buckboard 10 to 20 years ago. They're lucky if they get 50 now. And this guy said that they did like, I think, I thought he said they did like three buckboards with, you know, uh, a couple hundred people that were on them you know, 10 to 20 years ago, he said, we're lucky to get 50 people now. And that shows you how much the lack of deer and the um, abundance of predators we have and how they're preying mm. on deer, the impact, it's the economic impact it's having in northern Wisconsin. It's really harming businesses in northern Wisconsin, as well as farmers and pet owners who get their um, pets and animals attacked regularly by especially wolves. Well, when uh, so you come on uh, the second Thursday of every month, and uh, Senator Romain Quinn comes on the last Thursday of every month, and the last time he was on just a couple weeks ago, he had mentioned, the because, you know, I'm not a hunter, don't know anything about it, uh, but he had said that it was down like 18, 20, 30%, something in there, and I'm like, what's the big deal? That means less cars I'm, or less deer that we'll be hitting with their cars. Isn't this a good thing? And he brought up the economic impact. Saying, right, but if people drive all the way up here, as you know, and we all know around here in northern Wisconsin, northwest Wisconsin specifically, the tourism in the summer and or during the hunting season is gigantic. It helps our economy absolutely. So it started to make a little more sense to me. And he said that uh, if someone from Milwaukee or the Twin Cities that always comes up for this, but they're not getting any deer, then they're going to stop coming up here. They're going to find somewhere else to go. So I'm, I'm now understanding the economic impact of it. Is there any other uh, reason that this should be a concern for people, whether you hunt or not, around our area, northern Wisconsin, saying we want higher numbers? Other than the economic impact, is there any other reason why we should be concerned? Yeah, I just think that, as I commented at this hearing, um, I said, when you go through the federal forest lands now, or you know any vast um, tracts of public land, you no longer see deer um, on the on the roadways. I mean, you used to have to be really careful. Like when you went through the, I think back going through the Schwamga and Nicolay on Highway 70 and other places, we had these vast tracts. You just don't see deer any uh, anymore there. They've largely become urbanized in northern Wisconsin where they stay closer to homes mm. um, because that's where they get their protection from predators like wolves. So, you know, you have this lack of dispersal of uh, wildlife now as a result of wolves being that apex predator and they've just driven them out of areas. And I don't think that's good for the landscape. And how at this point, just to kind of put a bow on this because we're already blew past our time, do you f foresee a situation in the coming future where, where there will be a wolf hunt again? And if not, what would it take in order to have one? Oh, yeah, I'm optimistic that someday we're going to be able to get a wolf hunt. And uh, but I mean, the best way to do it is we got to take away judicial review. We got to pass a wolf hunt. Um, for Wisconsin at the federal level and remove judicial review because it's always the judges uh, that come in and say they're smarter than sportsmen, that they're smarter than um, the wildlife scientists that are all out there saying at this point there should be a wolf hunt. Um, so we need to take away that judicial review. I sure hope it happens because uh, there does need to be a wolf hunt. I will say the Department of Natural Resources under Governor Evers is going in the wrong direction, though, where they're now saying there should be over a thousand wolves before we have a wolf hunt in Wisconsin. 
uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service still has as their um, um, as their standard, a hundred wolves for the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and Wisconsin together, a hundred wolves. And over that, there should be a wolf hunt. The Evers administration is moving in the wrong direction on this, where they're saying now there's got to be over a thousand wolves. What By the way, uh, kudos, kudos to Representative uh, Sapic and um, Chance Green and Romaine Quinn uh, for putting this on. Um, I really appreciate that they invited me to join in on it, uh, but they're the ones that put it together, and kudos to them for doing mm. that. All right, so your session, or the, the, uh, you're almost finished. What's coming up for you this week? Uh, when are you no longer in D.C., and what are your plans for Christmas? Yeah, so as we speak, you know, here it's Thursday morning, and uh, mm-hmm. it's flyout day for us. We're going to cast our last votes the way it looks for this year. We'll be back uh, second week of January um, to deal with um, appropriations and budget stuff. And, um, yeah, so I got some stuff going on next week, some meetings with various people that in the district that I want to talk to that have issues. And um, so we'll be doing that. And then looking forward to about a week from now, the kids are going to be home for Christmas. And we're really looking forward to Christmas to New Year's and being able to stay home and enjoy Christmas with them. Well, that's right. This is, is this your first year with just uh, with all the kids out of the house, right? No, ah, second year. Second year now. Okay. We're still nice... adapting. We're... <laughs> oh, your poor wife. Oh, my goodness. Awesome. Thank you so much. And, yeah, this will be perfect because you come on the second Thursday. So this will be around the time where you're either going to be back in session or right about to be in a month from now. So, Tom, uh, thank you for coming on. And also, thank you for this whole year. Thanks for coming on every month, doing this live. Uh, not a lot of people enjoy, as guests, doing this live because you never know where it's going to go. So thank you so very much for always doing this, uh, being open and transparent and answering any questions that people have. I'm sorry, we're having an issue with our putting questions up. Everything is wonky, so we couldn't get to everything. Uh, but no kidding. Thank you so very much. And again, happy early birthday. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So uh, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year to all of your listeners. And thank you to all those Dryden and Wire viewers out there that make this show possible. Special thank you to Wisconsin's 7th Congressional District Representative Tom Tiffany for taking the com- time to come on, as he does every month, for a chat with us. I'll see you right back here on next Tuesday when Washburn County District Attorney Aaron Marco will be filling in for Barron County Sheriff Chris Fitzgerald for our latest episode of Positive Tuesday with Ben and Fitzy. So until then, for DrydenWare.com, I'm Ben Dryden saying thank you for watching and have a blessed day. <laughs>